welcome. It's great to see that it's such a full room. Um, we have, it, we're going to have an interesting conversation here. Uh, the first thing I wanted to throw out, though, is that if questions arise, call them out. Uh, we don't have a mic that will be roaming, but we will repeat the uh, question and the response. Um, we've, a lot of the talks have been talking about a specific area called topology optimization. And they've kind of mentioned it and referenced it, but they haven't really gone deep into it. And it's a very important topic because it branches out into a lot of areas and it's going to be increasingly significant as time goes on. And it is a byproduct really of 3D printing and of Industry 4.0. And I think important also to consider is that it's really in its very early stages now. Five years from now, we're going to look back and, and think we're in very primitive state because it's evolving very rapidly and we're finding it in, in many places that we don't expect, and people are doing very interesting things with it. So we wanted to really go deeper into it and give some better definition of what is topology optimization when we mean it. And so I'd like to start by just introducing or letting everyone introduce themselves. Um, we have a little bit before, but just as a reminder, um, I'm Scott Summit. I had a 3D printing company called Bespoke looking at prosthetic legs. Um, body parts of all kinds, and then I ran a Skunk Works, uh, which is a internal think tank exploration research center for 3D systems, which is a, a company that does a lot of 3D printing. And um, and now I'm doing some some other projects in some other science fiction areas. Um, Turlif. Yeah, I'm Turlif Vilbrandt. So um, I've got uh, background in computational geometry since I can remember basically. Um, I was put on a computer when I was six years old. Um, and uh, it's always been, and then I also have a, a background in art and sculpture as well, uh, and design. So it's, it's both for me, um, a applied computer scientist. I spent uh, 10 years developing some of the technology, if you were in my talk, that our company uh, now rolls out in Japan, actually, of all places. Um, and then uh, we sort of incubated uh, this company in Norway and then, and then rolled it uh, to the US. Uh, on the West Coast. And what we, what our company does, it's a little esoteric for a lot of people, is we've made a geometric kernel. That's like the core engine underneath all the software that defines how the geometry works and operates. It's the kind of the math that sits there and represents that thing in the computer. And so that's what we did. And it's a completely new way to do that. And it unlocks a whole lot of capabilities. Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, Tim Gertens. I, uh, I also actually have a double background. Um, I First I started mechanical engineering um, because I thought I was going to be a crazy inventor when I uh, finished mechanical engineering. But it turned out to be more theoretic and uh, I, I was more like uh, I wanted to do things with my hands and create things. So that's why I started design school um, and uh, finished design school also. So that's a double background and I've been working at a design office for the last 13 years, and we make you know uh, very experimental furniture. We we touched most uh, 3D printing technologies that are out there uh, because we always want to use technology that's not yet there or just there. So we want to be the first to use it. So that's how we also you know um, come in contact with uh, topology optimization uh, softwares and uh, everything that you need to actually 3D print because the software is actually and very necessary for that. So to start off the conversation, I want to roll back the clock way, way back when. So a long time ago, there we go, a long, long time ago, two very primitive people took two rocks and banged them together to make a very sharp edge. And they started a subtractive age because what they were capable of doing was subtracting. Bang rocks hard enough against each other, you're subtracting material until you get the net shape that you want. And that was a great solution. They didn't think of formative or additive because that wasn't, that wasn't in their field of vision. Later on down the line, somebody decided, well, they could, if they heated up this metal stuff and poured it in a cavity and let it cool, well, they could make a new net shape. And so that became the formative age. So they could form geometry into new shapes. Suddenly, it, it led to an explosion of new thoughts and new capabilities. And now fast forward to 34 years ago, and Chuck Hull from MIT realizes that you can blast a CO2 laser into a photopolymer, a liquid that, that polymerizes, that becomes solid when it 
hits uh, ultraviolet light. And by solidifying it, you can make something layer by layer. And that began the age of additive fabrication. So in a very broad sense, you could say those are the three main ways of making things. Now, there are subgroups. There's injection molding and die casting and everything else. But those are, those are some fairly main categories. Now, when you think of, for example, the chair that you're sitting on, and you reach down, it's like, OK, there's a square metal pipe there, and it's got a square metal back here that's been bent and welded to something else. Well, that's the byproduct of the tools that they had recently when they were making the chair, probably in around the 70s. And <clears throat> if you rolled back the clock 150 years, they wouldn't think in those terms because they didn't have the tools to do welded steel and extruded uh, metal and the, the tools to make this chair. So they made things out of wood. And along comes a group in Germany called the Bauhaus around the turn of the century. And they said, wait a minute, let's take this crazy industrial process that doesn't belong anywhere near the house and let's bring it into the house and start making chairs out of it. And that was, that was a completely radical idea. That, that was strange, it was alien. They created shapes that nobody could have imagined because up until that point, everyone had carved wood. And the fancier that carved wood meant that you were richer. Rich people had more carving than poor people. And that's how you, that's how you projected your wealth. So the Bauhaus changed all that. It was a political movement, of course, and it was also a social movement because suddenly chairs were available to everybody, or far more people. So fast forward, we have another thing that came about 34 years ago. We have 3D printing. And just like the Bauhaus taking this industrial tool and repurposing it for something it was never meant to do, we've opened entirely new doors. And we can reconsider things that we've been taking for granted. You know, everywhere from the simple chair that the Bauhaus reconsidered re, uh, to pretty much everything in our lives is now being reconsidered. <clears throat> now, why that's relevant for people in this room is that this is a very early industry. They're, it's a, what, $24 billion industry in the next year, two years. Um, it's growing very fast, and we've just scratched the surface of what it can do. It's capable of doing far more. It is not leveled out. It's exploding. We're, we live in this industry, and we can barely keep up with it, and we can barely get our heads around it. And so a country like Thailand that's looking at where are opportunities for manufacturing, well, there's a, a lot to be had here. It's really in how you understand it, how you consider it, and how you imagine a future. But I think the, for the most interesting people, it's going to be for the kids who are in college right now. Because we, we old guys here think in very old terms. We think in terms of the world of injection molding, machining, CNC machining, die casting, these very traditional ways of making things. And we're still very much locked into that mindset. We have to really work hard to get out of that traditional mindset to consider these new tools. But the next generation, they'll never have to consider that because they'll go straight to the good stuff. And so it's going to lead to, I think, a real explosion as these kids coming out of school now are learning to apply their talents to the new tools into an entirely new type of problem solving. So that's the background, and I think it's something very much to look forward to. A thing to consider with topology optimization is that it was not meant to do any of this stuff. It was meant simply to improve strength to weight ratio. That's all, so that with as little material as you can use, you get the most utility the most function out of it, and that's all. So that it's great for airplanes and rockets, but that was really the start of it. That's what motivated the beginnings of topology optimization. But what they didn't realize probably at the time was they cracked the door open, and it has exploded as a philosophical approach to product and part creation that is really going in every direction now. And it's very exciting to watch. And it's going to become more and more relevant as time goes on. And so with that, Jolif, would you like to throw in some thoughts? Um, yeah. So just once again, if anybody has a question too, just shout it out. Oh, this is supposed to be interactive. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess, yeah, there's a couple comments I'd, I'd probably sort of uh, like to, to uh, you covered quite a bit there. Uh, went back and back. Um, but it was good. Uh, so one of them is, 
another way to talk about the sort of ages we've gone through and what that means. And it's very interesting, right? So if you look at the different ages that we define in human history, one of the ways we do that is define it by mastery of material. So we have like Stone Age, Iron Age, Bronze Age, et cetera. Think about this for a second. Let, you, let your brain wrap, wrap around this. Today, we call it either the Atomic Age, the Age of Information, or the Digital Age. None of those are a material, not really. Not the way we understand materials. Not a material that we can grab in our hands and look at. That's a fundamental change, right? It's not the same thing anymore. So part of the reason for topology optimization and stuff is because that's where we have to go. Uh, and, and the fact that we have the computation, I mean, if we've got a world where you can't touch the stuff you're working on, right, then you've got to have algorithms and machines that can help you do that. Um, because if you're talking about the wood, for instance, um, well, if you're talking about a guy in a cabin with a, a whittling wood, right, he'd probably sort of naturally create his own kind of topology optimization, right, sitting there by the fireplace. Um, but if you can't touch that material, it's, it's a different game entirely. And it has a, a really profound impacts um, for us also as humans, because you know, I, I have a really good friend, awesome guy, went to Oxford, but he has to use his hands every day. You were just saying that to him, right? You gotta get your hands dirty. Um, and so there's this, this, this need for humans to actually touch things. So how do we make the intangible tangible, right? So also just like the Bauhaus years ago, by taking an industrial tool and bringing it into the house, they turned it somewhat accidentally, somewhat deliberately into its own art form, into its own aesthetic. And even though this tool, topology optimization, was never meant to be an art form, never meant to be a, a way to create beauty, it's now being turned into a thing of beauty. It's just a beauty that's very unfamiliar with what we think of the traditional sense of beauty, you know, from the Renaissance or, you know, Dutch masters or anything like that. And that's, I've always been a big fan of Tim's company, MX3D, because they're one of these companies that has looked at how to turn this very practical, very utilitarian aerospace born tool and treat it as a way to create beauty. Yeah, <clears throat> so, because that's also something you, uh, I think you always see in uh, history I mean, uh, you know, in the, in the space age, suddenly everything looked space age, right? <clears throat> the vacuum cleaners suddenly were, looked like rockets and everything looked like rockets because people were amazed by the fact that it was actually possible to, uh, to you know, to go to space and, and that, that creates a whole new form language, a whole new aesthetics. And, and 3D printing and topology optimization is doing exactly the same. Uh, I think it's really important to, to understand that, um, <clears throat> that digital manufacturing so 3D printing, digital manufacturing is more wider word. It's a better word act actually. And uh, topology optimization, uh, it's, it's not, you're not just using it to make things more efficient, uh, cheaper, or uh, I don't know, more lightweight. You can also uh, completely rethink the design. You d suddenly there's this, this, you have this new, very, very cool tool in your, in your toolbox. And, uh, and you should use it the right way, you know? You're not going to use a saw to uh, hammer a nail in the, in the wall. You're going to use it to saw something. And once you have that, you think, oh, what can, what can I do with it, you know? When we had computers and with the Photoshop, suddenly everybody was making their own uh, posters, you know? Everybody was a graphics designer, which, which you know, not, not all of them as good as the other ones, obviously, but, but suddenly you can, you can think, about, think about it in a different way. And uh, I think that's, that's going to be quite a big challenge for people to uh, wrap their minds around what what you can actually do with this. So for MX3D, we get a lot of questions. Uh, obviously, a lot of people come to us and they say, hey, guys, can you print this? Sometimes because they think everything's possible. Sometimes because they think it's for free. There's a lot of people that think, oh, it's, it's, for, it's coming from a printer, so it's for free. Uh, we, we, uh, we actually had a, a guy once, uh, and he, uh, he, said, but he said, can you print in gold? I said, yeah, you can print in gold. And the guy said, but then you guys must be rich. You must be rich, you know? <laughs> We're like, well, you know, that's not, not really how it works. But, uh, but, but so, and a lot of people, uh, so they ask us, they, uh, they you know, so once, another example, um, uh, an, an architect uh, asked me, can you print uh, three floating statues? 
uh, and they were sp supposed to float in, in the water in front of the uh, Statue of Liberty in New York, 30 meter high. I said, yeah, sure, we can print it, you know, it's no problem. Do you have a budget for it? And uh, yeah, yeah, she had a budget. <laughs> she had uh, about 100,000 euros uh, in total for three 30 meter high uh, printed statues, you know, that's, that's even the engineering doesn't uh, cut it. So, so we are always interested not in trying to uh, make parts that are already being produced in different ways um, um, cheaper in 3D printing, we want to look at what can you change in those parts. You know, what, what does the topology optimization uh, software, uh, other generative design softwares, how can you use them and how can you use 3D printing to actually create something completely new? And indeed, as you say, that with that comes a new form language that's not just practical, but also can be beautiful, you know. It's uh, something people are, are starting to see now and starting to understand and see, see, seeing the beauty of it. And uh, that's, that's actually what we are really interested in. What, what will the future look like? And uh, not, not what the future will cost, but what it will look like. So one of the things that makes MX3D, if you haven't checked their website, it's really worth checking the website because there's much, much more work than Tim has shown. One of the things that makes MX3D, I think, especially interesting as a very forward-thinking design and architecture firm is that your definition of a designer is a complete departure from the definition of a designer that I got when I was in school learning it. And when I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, I taught a very different, I, I taught to make a very different type of designer. And then you guys come along and kind of redefine what a designer is because you're using tools in a way that nobody had ever expected. And can you speak to that, of what your definition of the new designer is? Yeah, I, I, what I think is, uh, is uh, important, what, what we do, what we are interested, you have to always do what you're interested in, right? What, you, what, you, what, what moves you, what, what you think is, you know, what gets your blood running, blood flowing. And, and, uh, um, and we like technology, we like to explore, we like to invent, we like to fail, you know, which is we like to play around, basically. And by playing around, uh, you know, before you know it, you, you run out of tools that, that you want to do you want to make your um, designs with. So, so uh, Joris Laman, he's, he's the, the main designer of, uh, of the studio, and also most of the things you will see on the MX3D website uh, are his design. Um, uh, he always has ideas, we always have ideas that are just not possible. And then we use the tools that are there, the new, new, exciting tools that are there, but sometimes they're not there. And if they're not there, we're just going to make them ourselves. And that's, that's what I think is uh, interesting. And the designer shouldn't just use what's there. He should always think one step further, you know, just one, you know, add, add one level to the building, as you will. So, and I think that's, that's the way uh, innovation uh, comes about. Just uh, always take it one step further. And sometimes I'm really irritated by, uh, by yours. So yours is the designer and he's, uh, the, the, say, the creative mind. And uh, I'm more like the technical mind in the studio. So that works really, really well together. And then, you know, we come up with an ID, and then uh, we come up with a solution, but then he takes it one step further. He's like, oh, but maybe, you know, we should make it float. I'm like, oh, nah. You know, and then we just, just when you got it, take one step further and then make it hard on yourself. So. Well, so now you have me curious. What, what do you guys have waiting for the technology that doesn't currently exist? What, what's in those files that you're just holding off on for now? Uh, let me let me think. Let me think. We uh, we would well we would like to make a, a one person flying uh, uh, like drone or something, which is uh, half electrical electrically powered and half human powered, like you know a hybrid stuff like that. But but then you look at the physics and it's it's quite hard to do. You know if you if you look at uh, the rocket man's uh, uh, suit, it's it's good. It's noisy, but it's good. You know it's you're actually flying. And and if you take that that technology further and further and further. It's not going to be so noisy, and you, you will be able to fly for 15 minutes, for three hours. I don't know. So we are, we are always interested in uh, in seeing what you know, what we should do, what we can do, and what we cannot do yet. Like like that. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Turlip, what are you waiting for? What's what's your? Wouldn't it be cool if? Wouldn't it be cool if? Um, or what's what's coming down the pipes? Well, yeah, so I mean, the, the big thing for me, I think, is, uh, the, so, one, so when we talk about additive manufacturing, for, for me, the word additive really uh, has a lot of power, um, because you're, you're talking about 
I mean, it depends on which products and how, but for the most part, right, um, manufacturing is a destructive process. To make the chair you were talking about, you cut down a tree. But we're talking about actually shifting that. Additive, not subtractive, additive. At the moment, we're still using dead materials. The exciting thing for me is that's about to change. So you saw, if, if you were at my talk, I was, we work with some companies that do tissue printing, among other things. Um, those are self-organizing, which is also very cool because you can take advantage of that. So you can do really, really advanced stuff where you don't even have to print at the lowest resolution. Um, on top of that, if you're really going to be honest to the concept of additive manufacturing, then using reactive materials, living materials that organize after they've been printed, is, and, and it's not just an obvious solution, it is the, what's going to happen next. You're going to see printers move away from using plastics. I, I think steels and stuff will probably, but even then, you can look at crystallization that occurs as a reactive process. We actually, one of the most cited papers I ever worked on was with a man in Glasgow, and we were doing chemical reactions. So we were setting up chemical reactions and 3D printed chemware and setting them off. Um, so this is absolutely super exciting. We don't even know where it's going to go yet. And, it, and, and then if you start sort of extrapolating that out, you can start seeing the, the total impacts. It changes. I mean, the, the local manufacturing of additive manufacturing on top of, okay, we're doing, we're actually adding to the bounty of nature and not taking away from it. Um, you're, you're talking about using all natural materials since, well, more natural materials probably. I mean, imagine your phone case is made out of cellulose, not plastic. You don't have a, you don't have a problem with the sea now, right? There's, there's not all this plastic fo floating in the ocean. So... That's what I'm excited about. And, and I don't think it's that far away. Uh, I have a quick, quick question. So you're all from industry, right? <clears throat> so uh, how, how many of you have actually uh, come across 3D printing in a, in a, in a practical way? So not, not like uh, just the, the people from Enable gave me this beautiful thing for my daughter. I'm just going to show it because I'm really, I'm really proud that I got it, if I can get it out of my pocket. So look, like a nice elephant. Obviously, this, you know, obviously, oh, it broke off. Obviously, this is a toy, but it's uh, you know, but it's 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 really cool. But I'm talking about how many people have used 3D printing for for uh, improving parts, for getting parts in sooner. You have, yeah, there you have, you have as well, yeah. What, can you can you tell what kind of uh, what what you use it for or? Uh Yeah, so so quick quick prototyping and uh, and being able to uh, to to actually uh, yeah. You, well, well, yeah, but then at the same time, um, what, we, what we find with three D printing is uh, like we find a lot of people here in Thailand they don't have necessarily the funds to do things like uh, injection molding. Yeah. So three D printing is sort of that stopgap for them. So they're not at the scale of uh, injection molding, but sure. they're at the point where they can do something like a run of like a thousand parts or something. Yeah. So we're finding that people like that. They can really take advantage of the technology. And, and then, sorry, one, one question uh, after that then. So you're using 3D printing a lot. Are you also using uh, uh, generative design software or topology optimization software to really you know, we step it up? We've exploring that because we've been looking at doing like, things like space frames and whatnot for vehicles. Oh, uh, yeah. But um, like we've been using Fusion 360 yeah. so mm -hmm. to try to do that. But uh, yeah. it, it's not optimal yet. So um, actually, we're looking for better solutions out there. Yeah. Yeah, but you're exploring it uh, anyway. Yeah, cool. <coughs> really nice, cool. Scott. In 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 the context of like small runs, uh, Bespoke was your company, so maybe you want to sort of uh, talk a little bit about how you see that playing itself out in the future. Is everything going to be a small run? Well, what's interesting is some terms. We had we had a, a motto inside my company uh, called "One Size Fits One," and that was deliberately a contrast to the "One Size Fits All" mentality. Uh, which we thought is very dehumanizing and it is, doesn't treat a human as an individual anymore. So a couple things start becoming interesting when you are designing for one person. And we were talking about this yesterday. What happens when your local shoe store 
doesn't, when, when they, they capture the data of your foot and your biometrics, how you walk and your stance and your gait and any problems you might have, and they load that into your personal profile, what's your shoe size? Shoe size numbers, like nine and a half, whatever, 42, those go out the window because they become very irrelevant. And so you just have your data. Now that's your shoe size, of course. Uh, there are companies, many companies, working on doing the same thing with a body scan, a three-dimensional body scan, and that becomes your clothing size. You know, you're no longer small, medium, large, extra large. You are this data. And that becomes very interesting as well. Um, what I would like is a car company to, instead of giving me a seat that has over 150 pounds, which typical seat is, I would like them to scan me in sitting position and then print a seat for me. So it's not an adjustable seat, because adjustable seats only are a stopgap way to get one seat to fit everybody. But if it's my car, I want a printed seat for me. Uh, there, Ducati experimented doing that with motorcycle seats. I've experimented doing that with bicycle seats. Um, so things like that. Some of the traditional things that we're familiar with are really leftovers from an old age, like sizing charts. Well, those might start going away when you replace them simply with your personal data. And there are softwares that are now coming about. When I started Bespoke, it was very, very hard to take a personal data set and turn that into a personal product. Whether it was a prosthetic leg we were doing, or a cast, or a neck brace, or whatever it was, that took a designer a lot of work and a lot of technical skill. And then along comes Turlift's company, this is how we got to know each other, and they automated that process. So what used to take us maybe a week to do was done in a few seconds, just because they automated that process. They let the computer do it all. You simply load in your data, and then out comes your part. And so it's softwares like that that facilitate this, that make it very, very easy to do something that used to be very complex and very difficult. I will, uh, oh, yeah. That's true. We've been talking about topology optimization as if everybody's very familiar with it. Um, and in a very metaphoric term, which is we take 30 million years of Darwinian evolution and we condense it down to overnight. And that's just a metaphor. Um, Turlif has actually written the code that does that. So I will pass this and I will request that Turlif not treat this like a PhD thesis, which I know he's going to want to do. <laughs> Well, the, the answer is, is there isn't one way. And uh, again, in my talk, I mean, I was kind of showing that. There's a number of ways to do it. In effect, uh, it was sort of the whole point. There's an infinite number of ways to do it. Um, when you talk about sort of standardized topology optimization, uh, it's a uh, you know, vector force algorithm across a block with forces and stresses placed on it. And I won't get, I won't get further, further into it than that. Oh, describe it. Yeah, so if you, if you take a block, and you stick forces at certain parts of the block, right? And then you've got uh, effectively a, a set of cubes, voxels. If you guys know what voxels are, they're 3D pixels, right? And or and you can they don't have to be actually voxels. That's another story. And you can do them at multi-scale. Actually, there's uh, one professor that we work with now who actually does multi-scale topology, uh, multi-material and multi-scale topology optimization. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and you pass those forces through. Uh, by a series of different simulation techniques. Um, they're not, there's actually, again, it's sort of a misnomer to think that there's one way to do that. And that's actually, and when we talk about traditional topology optimization, that's traditional topo topology optimization, like you see in Fusion 360 or something like that, right? That's out there. Um, but there's a lot of other ways to do it. I mean, I was showing in my talk, like, you know, we're using Voinoy tessellation. That's not that topology optimization at all. Those, those points aren't on a voxel grid. They move to wherever you want to put them. So, so what's, what's happened? You, you yeah, in forces, it, you load yep. Newtons, and you say, here's what's going to happen. Sure. The software. Yeah. So, so in the case of uh, when you're looking at, so you you start propagating out, 
and you start checking uh, the forces to see whether or not you have strength in certain directions um, or you start to get failure in, in the object on a basically ongoing mini simulation. Um, that then typically if you're doing closed loop like I was showing, you actually can send that out then to a more robust simulator on the other end. But sort of typical topology optimization does that kind of already by itself. If you're doing the stuff I was showing uh, with Voinoy tessellation, in that case what we're actually doing is we start with a Voinoy set. Um, we run that Voinoy set. We understand at the different struts and positions in that structure uh, where we get uh, strength and weakness, uh, right? So if you're looking at a colored picture, would, I think I showed, right, it's re where it's red, you're in, a, you're in bad news, right? Where it's blue, you're good, green, good to go. Um, and we can feed that data directly back into the model and shift those points or delete them and get rid of them entirely, right, to different positions. Those points, in the case of Voinoy, those points dictate where the Voinoy tessellation occurs. It's, it's the same thing effectively with topology optimization, traditional topology optimization, again, Fusion 360. That's just on a very, very fast scale. So, Tim, how do you guys yeah. design the chair? What was the, the process step by step? To yeah. Chair? Yeah, I think because that's why I also think it's an interesting question. Um, it's. Um, Usually also with topology optimization software and with all the generative design software, it's not just the computer. It's like it's like the symbiosis between the designer and the computer. And that goes for both the technical uh, uh, optimizations, but also for the creative optimizations. I mean, so if you optimize something, you optimize it for a certain production technique. And uh, if you would optimize it for 3D printing, you have to know what type of 3D printing you are using, what kind of material are you going to use. So that those are all you know, constraints or all, all variables that you can put in the software. If you, if you look at the chair, um, so probably most of you have seen the presentation uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, so the, the, the chair uh, optimization, that was, that was one of many, many, many results. So the first results we had, so we, we took the, the design space, put forces on it that you would expect, and then press play, and then a week later we got an iteration back, a chair with like 50, 50 legs, you know, like a, almost like a forest underneath the chair. We're like, okay, that doesn't look anything like a chair anymore. So that's probably not, you know, it's probably not right. And then, then you start putting constraints in. You're like, okay, uh, people know a chair uh, needs to have like three or four legs or, or or you know, at least not 50 legs. It's not really practical. So, and and step by step, you kind of get to a result that's uh, that makes sense. So it's uh, with generative design software, with topology optimization, the the hand of the designer or the technician, I think, is very important. You're you're also probably always when you generate something, you're judging it, right? You're judging it, saying like, is this good or is this not good? Is this well, yeah, beautiful I mean in your in your case, in the case of the prosthetics, they have to be beautiful, right? The, the computer cannot do beautiful. The computer can just do what you tell it to do. And you have to decide if it's beautiful or not. Yeah, and I mean, that brings up another, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I was touching on the talk, um, but it, you can go really deep on this, which is that designers are now not designing a single object uh, traditionally, right, in the, in the way that they traditionally did. You're, you're looking at actually setting up an environment, right, setting up some kind of template, constraints, and then having a dialogue with that thing you created. It's very interesting. It's an entirely different process, right? So you're creating so you, a tool rather than the, yeah. the product. Well, right? even kind of more than a tool because it's so interactive. It's almost like you created a, you know, a little imp, right? Yeah. And you're having a conversation with that imp. You're like, now can you drill a little more over there? Oh, OK, great. Now can you go over there, yeah. right? And it's, it's actually something that programmers know, right? Programmers do this. And in fact, coding is about how fast your iterations are. So how fast you can cycle through one iteration, get it compiled, test it, decide whether that's what you want to do it again. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a really different mind think for designers. And I, I don't know, Scott, if you have any thoughts about that, because I don't know if that has kind of messed with your design processes, if that, is that's been positive or negative. Yeah, well, I think what's, what's interesting is that that leads to a different mindset of the designer, where when I was working at Apple, we knew exactly, exactly what we wanted to design. And we judged ourselves by how exactly what came out of the assembly line captured what we designed into it. And that was a real challenge. Now all of a sudden it's very strange for a designer who's, who's used to being very top down, very authoritarian, a kind of design dictator. And designers love being dictators. They, they'll never admit that, but we love that. Well now all of a sudden the designer has to relinquish control, has to give up control to something else. 
it's an uncomfortable thing, but it's, it's a type of new designer that's emerging. We did that with the process when you're creating a prosthetic leg because the one thing that you can't control in that is the person. The first ingredient that you put in there is something that you have no control over because you're importing somebody else's body. And that led to a really interesting new design style which we'd never imagined before. So that is a different flavor of design because you get surprised by what comes out because you're co-designing your product with something else that you, you can't control. How, how do you think that affects education? Well, and that, that's a big yeah, challenge. Yeah, In, interesting question, yeah. Yeah, Turlif asks, how does that affect education? Well, one of the things that we were talking about at lunch is that schools, this is all so new that I don't know of schools that are teaching it, certainly not the way I taught my students. And so if there are educators here or people who are looking into the educational system in Thailand for how you, how you raise the next generation of designers and engineers, the old way of thinking, that very top-down way, is relevant, but it's not the complete picture anymore. That giving them an infusion of some of these new tools is what's going to make them competitive on a global market and is going to make them really forward-thinking designers. Uh, when you look at companies like Airbus, they don't want the old-school designer because so many of their parts now are created this way. You know, we're talking about a 1,000 parts on the Airbus 350. Um, Autodesk worked with them on, it sounds simple, but a wall divider between the, the classes in their, uh, in their airplanes. That wall divider alone saves something like 20,000 tons of CO2 per year because they use topology optimization. So little details like that have tremendous environmental impact. You know, we can, we can circle back and go into the environmental benefits of topology optimization. There are many of those, certainly. But addressing the next level of students and really getting them infused with this very new type of thinking is, I think, one of the most important things that a country like Thailand, but also pretty much every country that creates engineers from its schools, should be really considering and really learning how to do to keep its students relevant on the global stage. Yeah, we, 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 for, for instance, we cannot find uh, the right type of designer almost anymore. We have a very, very talented uh, uh, generative design, cat designer uh, working for us, and we're really happy with him. And, and uh, right now, another one. But it's, it's uh, most students that come from architecture school or, or engineering school, they just don't know how to use the right tools yet. They're, they're learning, but I mean, we need people that can, uh, that can uh, use uh, Turlif's tools, you know, and, uh, and can do something, something with it. And I think it's really important that the, the, the youth will, will get in contact with these techniques, learn these techniques as soon as possible, because that's, uh, otherwise we're gonna be, definitely gonna be short in the future, right? I mean. Uh, be interesting, uh, how many people are involved in any kind of policy making in the room? Is, that, is there anybody here? Okay. So one of the interesting things I think about this when we talk about education is, is that you're, you've got this shift where it's not, education is gonna be a bit more open. We were just talking about you set up your environment and you have a dialogue with it, right? That's not a super structured, piped education system, right? You're not saying do X, do Y, and then you succeed. You know, it's do X, do Y, have a conversation, and I don't know, right? That's a different way to think. Um, and so I think it has really profound impacts going forward and needs to absolutely be dealt with again. Uh, additive manufacturing is, you know, uh, is not the fourth industrial revolution, in my opinion. Um, there's really good evidence to, to say that it's uh, a complete shift. Um, so you're talking about something uh, similar to the industrial revolution period itself. All these things, you know, Scott's talking about Manufacturing for one, that's the antithesis, right? We're sort of back to the future to the Renaissance or something, right? But this time with a whole lot of tools and a whole lot of power that we never had before. So it's, it's not anything. It's not the past, um, but it's not even the, the recent past. So, so in order to deal with that, education and sort of government policy really has to start looking at it. And, and the, your top-down structures of manufacturing also entirely change. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about localization. Actually, the, the, um, it's more thing looking at the students who are getting aware of this, these tools. We're showing a lot of structure here in, in the, the pictures that we selected and things like that. Um, but it, that is actually a, a fairly limited perspective. It's not limited to structure. Uh, and we want to make sure we drive that home. Some of the things you'll see here look like radiators or heat exchangers, heat sinks. There are a lot of ways to, to call that. Well, when you are cooling an object, which is a very common thing to do for any 
uh, type of electric vehicle or internal combustion vehicle or technology device or chips, things that generate heat that you have to dissipate, you have to get rid of that heat. Well, that is limited by uh, the geometry. The radiator in your car was designed the way it is, not because that was the best way to design a radiator, but that was the cheapest way to get the most cooling done with the tools they had. Well, now companies like Tesla are looking at 3D printing topology optimized radiators that can cool things down in ways never before made. And they can, they can 3D print them out of copper or beryllium copper, some of these materials that really dissipate temperature. Um, but it's not even just that, it's, um, but it's also uh, waveguides. It's also invisible materials. It's, can you touch yeah, on Yeah, sure. That? Yeah, so I mean, one of the really interesting things that's happening is, is uh, metamaterials, right? So I didn't really touch so on metamaterials. Like metamaterials. Yeah, metamaterials. So metamaterials means that you take, uh, and you can even do this at the gross scale. You kind of saw that with the, the doorknob, right? That's, that's a kind of metamaterial, a little bit. Um, so, you know, but at the very, very small scale, amazing things start happening. So there's a whole group of scientists around the world right now. There's a whole area, there's a whole set of journals dedicated to it that are working on cloaking. And so invisibility, right? But when I say cloaking, I'm not just talking about light. That's one. But it's cloaking of everything. So light's one, right? Hydrophobic cloaking is another. Explain. Um, yeah, so it actually... <laughs> Sorry, so when I say cloaking, um, you've created structures in a material at a very, very small scale, at a very complex form, that actually takes whatever it is you're trying, you have something, say, in the center of, of a board, if you're, if you're talking about a MIM or something, right? And what you want to do is you want to flow light or heat or electricity in such a way that it doesn't reach some area of, the, of space, right? And they're able to do this actually able to do this for light cool water yeah it's amazing heat there's there's, there's heat there's invisibility heat. that's a radiator oh uh, yeah for heat dissipation. This 3D printed now. i think there's another one if the uh if the mim is yeah. yeah yeah so and you can actually see i mean there's just these dead spots where where the the stuff isn't isn't reaching right and in the case of light you can't see it <laughs> so yeah so i mean that's that's gigantic again you're you're going you're we're being imbued with superpowers. This is the kind of stuff nature does. Um, there's another heat exchanger, very small, impossible to make traditionally. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a heat exchanger. It's printed on a very small scale, but that would have been impossible to make traditionally. But what it can do is yeah, it, it has properties, thermal properties, that were never achievable before. So that's another value of 3D printing. You know, we're talking structure a lot, but thermal and all these other areas as well. Um, and then when we get into biologics, well, we're way over time to be doing that. But biologics are another area for this all as well, as, as 3D printing goes into biological space. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure, um, so just so you know, uh, well, thanks, uh, at Makerspaces, we do a lot of 3D printing. Um, we've had a lot of the government ministers come by. We've had the deputy prime minister come by. We've had the U.S. ambassador come by. If you're talking and those terms. Oh, okay. So, in, in this case, um, I guess the government listened because we've been pushing for additive manufacturing for quite some time. Now the government is deploying 300 new makerspaces throughout the schools in, here in Thailand. Fantastic. So, the school system? Yes. That's wonderful. Uh, through the that Ministry of Science and Technology. So, but it needs to be done the right way. And that's what I was going to ask. Uh, the thing is, and you guys are um, like designers and very successful in the forefront of the field. Uh, now, the education system here in Thailand, though, is, as you have been warning, very top-down, very heavy-handed, uh, very, very little room for creativity. So the question then I have for you is, what advice do you have for the policymakers and the educators here in this country so that they can produce more people like you guys? <laughs> That's, we're, we're honored and flattered for the, uh, the response and the question. Um, that was a challenge I had. One of the things I found, um, I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon, and 50% of my students were from Korea. Uh, that's just the way Carnegie Mellon is structured. And they're brilliant students. The biggest challenge I had is that none of them had ever failed at anything in their lives. 
<laughs> which I thought was amazing. It's like my life has more failures than I know what to do with. These kids had never failed at anything. They were perfect human beings. And that's a real problem for design because you can't take that mentality into design or you'll be very cautious. And so... Yeah. So I, I walked in my first day and I realized this and I said, okay guys, the student that plays it safe and does a brilliant job that succeeds is going to fail. The student that takes wild moonshots and blue sky crazy ideas that blow my mind and surprise me and even if the project fails, they're going to get the highest grade. And that terrified the students. <laughs> I think half the students dropped the class within five minutes. But that was the best thing for them to hear, is that mentality. Uh, Stanford teaches that day one of, of D school and product design school, fail early, fail often. And there are a lot of books written on it, but that's a very important mentality to infuse into the schools. I think there might be some ways to encapsulate that too, and, and, you know, for, for a given cultural location. So you don't have to go all in at once. I mean, everything's got to be a progression, you know, Certainly, you know, that can hurt when you do that. So there's ways to progress towards it, too. Yeah, I think because I, I think that's that's a perfect point. I was going to say uh, almost exactly the same. Uh, I think room for playing around, failing is playing around, right? Playing around is, is being allowed to fail. Uh, that's that's so important. That's that's basically what we do all day, you know, in, in our work. It's just playing around. Uh, and uh, we, we, at MX3D, we get a lot of companies that visit us, and then uh, then we do a little presentation. And the bigger the company is, the more money they have, the bigger the bigger organization it is, the less room they have for playing around. Unless you're a Google and you have like a, this this crazy moonshot uh, division. But but um, you, and and I cannot stress it enough. Every company should have should create and and schools as well should create room for people to play around, uh, being being able to fail. Because only then, exactly what uh, Scott's saying, only then can you innovate. Yeah, you got a question now. Go ahead. Nice. Um, our, um, our biggest contribution has been putting out work that is embarrassing. I actually think that, you know, I've never seen something from you, Scott, that isn't beautiful. That's, on the one hand, to your credit. He hides it. That's, well, that, that is very deliberate because we have I, vast warehouses of absolute <laughs> failures. That's right. But I just don't. However, put them in the right. Press. My, point, my point is that you might do quite a service to all of the people you're trying to encourage if you exposed embarrassing work. And it's very hard to do it as a professional, but that's one of the reasons Enable, I think, has been able to make real contributions. Because we're, yeah. we, we're, that's not our strategy. Right. right, that's a very good point. Um, I think we're out of time. So I think the next lecture, I don't know who it is, but they're brilliant, I'm sure. Um, they're about to start. But we will be circulating around, and yeah, we'd love to talk throughout the day. So thank you for your time. It's an honor to have you, and we appreciate talking to you.